I'm very happy to welcome you all here this evening. And on behalf of all of our friars, I want to thank you sincerely for your presence and for the support which your presence represents. This is a very special night, which is obvious, I think, by the exceptional response to the invitation we extended to you for this occasion. My name is Father Michael Di Gregorio. I have the privilege of serving as the Prior Provincial of the province of St. Thomas of Villanova. Not too many years ago. Thank you. Not too many years ago, our province's creative and dynamic advanced new director, Madonna Sutter. suggested that we undertake an initiative which we now call Profiles in Augustinian Leadership, through which we invite individuals to tell the story of the way in which they have been influenced and touched by Augustinians, by our ministries, and by the Augustinian spirit or charism. And the first three persons who responded to this invitation spoke from this dais or another dais in New York City. Chris Geisens, the president and CEO of Wawa, who was an alumnus of one of our high schools, St. Augustine Prep in Richland, New Jersey, as well as an alumnus of Villanova University, uh, spoke to us as our first invited guest. Then Jack Brennan, the former CEO of Vanguard, and presently the chair of Vanguard's charitable endowment, who happens to be a parishioner of St. Thomas of Villanova Parish in Villanova, came and spoke to us. And thirdly, Mark Jackson, the director of athletics at Villanova University, spoke to us in New York. Mark is with us here again tonight. Each of these men exercised positions of leadership in their respective fields. And they speak of the ways in which the Augustinian spirit and charism have influenced their lives and continue to characterize the way in which they exercise leadership in their chosen fields. Tonight, Father Rob Hagen, a 1987 graduate of Villanova, will tell us his story. It's obvious that the Augustinian ethos touched the young undergrad Rob Hagen in a very special way, a bit differently than it did the others I mentioned. And in the best Augustinian spirit, Father Rob is very modest about the leadership he exercises. But we all know that he's made the basketball court by his presence an arena for evangelization and Augustinian pedagogy. And he's also brought to national television a Catholic priestly presence that we have not seen since the days of the So I know we're all anxious to hear Father Rob, and so Father Rob. Thank you, Father Michael. I ran into my friend Bernie, he's here tonight, and uh, he caught my eyes, I walked in the door, and he looked at me, he goes, yeah, we couldn't get Sister Jean. <laughs> Do my best. <laughs> you know and I know this is not a night about me. I look around here and see so many people whose lives have been touched by an Augustine. And so many married you, so many baptized your child, so many picked you up when you were down, so many heard your confession when you were troubled. And the same is true in my own life. We are blessed 
because of the spirit and charism of St. Augustine and those who have gone long, long before us and to support and promote and hope and pray for those who will be here long, long after we are. It's, it's kind of like a, a version of Augustinian hazing <laughs> to fill the room with some of the most respected, accomplished leaders that I know and then ask me to tell you about leadership. And hurry up because the Eagles play tonight. <laughs> But I, um, I've had a great opportunity to reflect. Uh, it was 20 years ago this year that I took my first vows. And so I thank you, Father Michael, for it. the opportunity to, to really think about, you know, how, how did I get here? And where am I going? And, and, and what I just keep coming back to is I... I've learned from you. I've learned from you. So many of you here in this room, Augustinians who are now in heaven, that have taught me really life lessons. I'm not going to offer you any highbrow theory on leadership. But I would say, and I talked to a a lot of people who are in business, who are in law, who are in medicine, are incredibly talented and gifted students. And, and to be honest with you, what, what I try to instill in them is what my mom instilled in me. Take your faith into every single thing that you do. And uh, you know, you think about the story of uh, the man who passed away, he's up, he's up in heaven at the gate, gates of St. Peter. And uh, he's holding all this stuff. He's got ketchup and mustard <laughs> and relish and mayonnaise. And he's, he's got all this stuff in his hands. And St. Peter comes out and he says, you know, hey, did you keep the Ten Commandments? <laughs> and he says, Ten Commandments? I thought it was the Ten Condiments. <laughs> Isn't that really what we all do if we're not careful? We're, we're running around and we're carrying around all this stuff. Some of it's material stuff that's just occupying way too much of our time and attention. Some of it's things from the past, broken heart, grudge, whatever. We're carrying all this stuff around. And, you know, somebody gave me a slab of wood about three years ago. And it has these ten principles on it. It doesn't say Exodus or any Old Testament site. It just says, put God first. Listen to your parents. Tell the truth. Don't hurt anyone. Don't be jealous of what other people have. Love the one you marry. And that sat in bubble wrap in my office for about three years until around Christmas time. I was cleaning up my office and I said to myself, in a lot of places, I wouldn't even be allowed to hang these up. And so I hung it up and I get a lot of student traffic in my office and they come in and they sit down and it's almost like, hey, what's that? It's like, they're, they're, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they're the Ten Commandments. <laughs> And think about it in your own life. And I know we've got some real, real leadership in this room. You're running companies, you're running dental practice, you're running school. And you want to incorporate these values into every single thing that you do. And so, yes, I, I did that. I did learn that from my mom. She's, she's here tonight. Uh, Got a little bit off her fastball these days. 
but you know, single mother, lost my dad in her 40s, uh, never gave up, daily communicant, 630 Mass, trolley L into downtown Philadelphia, worked as a secretary, right on the table, prayed us all through school. That's what she did. It never left me. It was an MO for the rest of my life. And, and so, again, without any highbrow leadership theory, St. Augustine says prayer is conversation with God. You got a problem, you got a situation, you got a meeting, you got a child who's astray, you got a difficult, uh, a difficulty meeting the bottom line. Can you with your higher power? And see if you don't get some wisdom and some peace and an interior disposition to deal with whatever it is that you're dealing with. I can remember being at uh, in the Final Four, you know, and thank you, Father Michael, for all the <coughs> accolades around basketball. We got a really good coach, don't we? <laughs> and we're in the Final Four in 2016. We're gonna play Oklahoma, right, in a football stadium with a basketball court in the middle, right? So there's you know, 85,000 screaming fans, and Bill Raftery is out on the court, and as always, he wants to know where Jay is, because he wants to come back and talk to Jay. I said, well, yeah, he's back there, I'll walk back with you. So we're walking back off the court, and these irate Oklahoma fans spot my collar. <laughs> you gotta pray for both teams, Father. <laughs> And Raph looked him right back in the face without missing a beat. He said, he is praying for both teams. He's praying for his team to win and your team to win. <laughs> we know, you know, we pray, not because we're going to win every game, pass every test, get every promotion, get the clean CAT scan. We pray to a God and a spirit that connects all of us together that says, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, God will never abandon you. And so these are the values. These are the values that I, I learned in my family. And then as I, I came to Villanova, I didn't come to Villanova to be a priest. It was not part of my plan. I met some wonderful people there, Augustinians. And I had a good friend, Father, Father Bill Atkinson, who you, you, we all know, right? And these values, they, they really apply. And, and, and what I learned from my mom, who I, I, we talk a lot about balance in life. You want to have balance in your life, right? You go to class on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You do yoga on Tuesdays and Thursday, right? You go to mass on Sunday, and you go to you know you go to the beach for a week in August. That's that's balance. What I learned from my mom is integration. The faith is is not a Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing or just a Sunday thing. It's an everyday deal. And you know I work with the athletes, and I tell them all the time: our faith is like a muscle. It's like any other muscle. We exercise that faith muscle. It's there in our weaker moments. And we don't, it atrophies like anything else from lack of use. And so that's, that's what I've learned. And over time, I've watched you all apply it in your life. And it works. It works. Wall Street Journal article last year states that as they're interviewing uh, up in Manhattan, up in Wall Street, they have scrapped the traditional question of tell us about yourself. I want to hear just about yourself. What they've done is they replaced that question with tell us something you've had to overcome.
We're in a world that demands and requires resiliency. Everybody gets knocked down. Everybody's experienced division, been passed over for promotion, had a difficult breakup, didn't make it on social media. <laughs> and what do we do? What, what's that internal, what's that internal gravitas, that internal grounding that enables us to continue to flourish and rise above whatever it is that might be weighing us down? When Jesus journeyed from Galilee to Jerusalem. The most direct route was through Samaria, but most people wouldn't go through Samaria because Jews and, and Samaritans didn't get along. So most people would take a securitous route around Samaria. So you didn't have to deal with the tension. You didn't have to deal with the conflict. You didn't have to deal with the problems. When Jesus journeyed from Galilee to Jerusalem, what did he do? He went through Samaria. He went through it. He said, no. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We go through them with each other. Nobody spent more time in the desert than Father Bill. And he, and, you know, he, he said it time and time again. And maybe someday this will be on the back of a prayer card on his on, on the feast day of his of his canonization. And every morning I wake up. At 6 a.m., under the crushing weight of the cross. And by 6.01, God had sent people to help me. Never underestimate the value of your encouragement, your word, your hand in making a difference in somebody else's life and helping them get through their Samaria, through their desert experience. I tell the kids all the time crisis in Greek means opportunity. And you talked about, Father Michael, the, the, the people that stood up here at this podium for our last events, incredible leaders who embraced hardship and difficulty in their businesses in crisis and saw opportunities, saw ways around them, saw, saw new ways of thinking that weren't there because they persevered and they had faith. And they built a community and a culture around their employees. And so, as I reflected on my, my call, the Samaria moment, one of the Samaria moment, moments that I'd rather have gone around was the death of my dad. You know, he goes to bed one night in his 40s and he never wakes up. But I must say, crisis opportunity, through that experience, through his death, he gave me two of the greatest gifts that he ever could have given me. One, the Confessions of St. Augustine. Mom says, go, can you clean out his car and just get his stuff together? I said, okay, I didn't know him to be a particularly religious man. I clean out the back of his car, get some dry cleaning in there, a bit of a drink, grease and a bottle of vodka in the trunk. <laughs> and he had a library book that he had checked out in February, he passed away in May, it's three months overdue. <laughs> I don't know what the statute of limitations is, but I still have it. <laughs> I'm 17 years old. I read about a man who was a sinner before he was a saint, who had a relationship with God after he tried a lot of other relationships and a lot of other roads, and all the same roads that you and I go down and the dead ends. He said, Lord, you made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. It stuck with me. I tried to shake it. It wouldn't go away. And the other gift being, life is short. Make it count. It's nothing to be afraid of. God's not trying to trick us up or scare us. He's trying to get us all to get as much out of the time that we have on this earth as we can. And whether that's 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, or 90 years. To live with some urgency. Not be in a hurry. To recognize the people along the way. But to live with some purpose and some urgency about what we're doing when we wake up in the morning. And so, 
as I learned about Augustine, there really are, for me, kind of four pillars that I took away from his, his teaching and his life. And the first being a core foundation for Augustine, as he talks about if you want to build any structure that's high and big and lasting, before you build anything up, you got to dig down. And you have to have a foundation upon which everything else will stand. And that foundation is humility. Stay humble. We all love people who are hummus from the earth down to earth. And I look around here, I see a lot of incredibly successful people in this room who live with humility, who are willing to just help people under the radar. I've got my uh, Aunt Lois and Uncle Jack here tonight, uh, probably been married over 60 years. Um, Everybody, you know, likes to talk about, you know, well, who's the smartest guy in the room? Well, that guy thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. John Babalakwa is the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> he's 90 years old. He spent 40 years heading the uh, neurology department at, at the University Hospital of Pennsylvania. Uh, the lives that he touched. Uh, that, that, that he and, and Lois have interacted with. And, and in, in, in spite of all that, of, of all the success, what, what my lasting image of you two is, every Saturday night, 5 o'clock Mass, Second Pew, St. Dots. <laughs> and a true academic heavyweight who is in there on his knees, asking for wisdom, asking for strength, asking for grace and healing for his patients and their family. That stuck with me. And so when I hear Augustine talk about that, and then I start to see it in action in people like you, I talk to the team. Nobody gets more adulation than those guys but they see the value of being humble. Neil Armstrong, one of the most recognized feats of all time, first person to walk on the moon. Incredible feat, recognized worldwide. Interesting thing about Neil Armstrong, he never talked about it. He never talked about it. Because he was so acutely aware of the sacrifice and the people and the things that went into that achievement. And he was all about one small step for man, one giant leap for humankind. Greg Popovich is a very, very smart man because he hired our coach, Jay Wright. <laughs> and, I, and I saw a quote from him recently. He was asked, what do you look for when you recruit a player? And you can imagine the, the answers, you know, height, weight, you know, time in the 40, average points per game. He said, we look for people. We didn't even say player. We look for people who are over themselves. People who are willing to fit in to something bigger than themselves. And sacrifice a part of the ego for great good. I tell the guys all the time about Muhammad Ali. I have to remind them, you know, Ali was Will Smith playing in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and Ali was in his prime, right? He was the greatest, right? He was the greatest. Smart, articulate, athletic. And he was asked to go into a, 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 a Southside Chicago hospital to visit a 12-year-old boy with cancer. And he said, absolutely, I'll go visit the young man. And he falls into the room, you know, with all his bravado. And he's like, young man, I'm Muhammad Ali. And I'm the greatest champion there ever was. And me and you, we're going to knock out cancer together. And the young boy looked him back in the face with peace in his face. And he said, no, I'm going to die. And when I die, I'm going to meet God. 
And when I meet God, I'm going to tell him what you did for me. And all he said never in his life was he ever so humbled, so acutely aware of from whom his gifts come and what he's called to do with them. You know what Augustine would talk about grace, gratia, gratitude. It's a perspective, isn't it? When we're walking around in life, when you have a grateful heart, you can kind of look past a little bit more of the bumps in the road. I'm a sophomore at Villanova. I work as a bartender on the weekends, and I'm working as a supermarket. I'm working in a supermarket during the week, and it's fall break, and I got a bad case of FOMO. Fear of missing out. Right? All my friends are going to Cancun and I'm working in a supermarket. And I come in on Monday night and Monday nights were they pull all the ripe produce off from, from the wheat and they put them in these four shopping carts and then you wrap up the ripe fruit and throw the rest in the dumpster. I'm wrapping fruit. I'm like, they're on the beach. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting it all together. End of the night, I got all the all the break, sellable fruit back up on the aisle, and I have uh, these two big plastic trash cans I got to take out to the dumpster. And this is in Drexel Hill, by the way. And I take it out to the dumpster, and I'm out to haul it in, and in the dumpster is two eyes looking right back at me. And he was startled and I was startled. I said, you good? He said, yeah, I'm just hungry. And so I, you know, I put the can down. I said, there's some, there's some bananas here. I just tossed it over until I couldn't even reach them. And he smiled at me and he said, thank you. I see that guy all the time in my head. And it's a perspective that God gave me to get over myself. When something isn't going my way, something's breaking down, when you get passed over, you feel like you were left off the list. To have a grateful heart for what we do have instead of being so focused on those those things that I don't. And we're talking about leadership, and, and there's nothing better than, as you, you, you lead your companies, to, to let your employees know how much they're appreciated and they're valued. <coughs> Mark Jackson's with us tonight. I love working with Mark. He, he's an incredible leader. He's the first person that I worked with that, as he would lead a meeting, has as an agenda item, who should we thank him? That's a beautiful quality in life, in family, in business. Who can I thank today? Have we thanked enough people? Is there somebody we overlooked? And to reflect on that, it's amazing, isn't it? What a little appreciation when people feel they're valued. Joe Wimmer, all great Augustinian. Uh, professor I had in the, in the seminary. He said, grace is the transformation that takes place within a person when they know that they're loved. When people know that you care, when you look them in the eye and they see that you know that they matter, or maybe they share a little something that might be going on in their life that you weren't able to share with somebody else, you get it through Samaria. You get it through the desert. You put a little twinkle in their eye, a little spark back in their step. You get those two pillars, you get humility and gratitude. Now you're ready to go. Now go help somebody else. Serving leadership. Augustine was all about it. 
And we hear all these, we're looking at all this politics, and we're hearing people at the top of the mountain, and it's whoever has the loudest voice, and who can, you know, scream the loudest. Augustine's model of leadership was, for you I'm a bishop, with you I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm down here with you. I love that show, Undercover Boss. Right? <laughs> the leader comes in and starts working in the dishwasher with everybody else, finds out their problems, and how things really are in their life. Servant leader. Maybe you're not at the top of the mountain. Maybe you're at the bottom holding the ladder so everybody else can get up first. That's what I think a lot of you do as parents. What you do for your kids. You just at the bottom of the mountain holding the ladder so that they can get up. People love to talk about those championships. I love to talk about those championships too. People will ask about, you guys, you did that whole, you played on that Holy Thursday. Did you, did you really do that? Yeah, we really did that. <laughs> and it wasn't my idea. It was Jesus. You play on Holy Thursday. He wants to show you his disciples, his teammates, what life is all about. It's about serving, not being served. He bent down and washed the feet of his disciples. That's not an act you try with a team unless you have a coach and his wife who are into that, unless you have an athletics director and his wife who are into that, unless you have a president of the university who is into that, and you have a culture that says, we're about this. So you get a couple of pictures of water, a couple of pictures of water. Jay takes off his shoes and socks. If you read his book, the first picture had I see in it. <laughs> Who knew? Jay got a seat with a wash with ice tea. We got another picture. He washed Arch's feet. Arch washed Josh's feet. Chris Jenkins got his feet washed. The managers got their feet washed. The walk-ons had their feet washed. These, these, the assistant coaches, the assistant coaches' wives, people that never play, people that do the laundry, because, and Jay loves to say, our roles are different, but our status is the same. And that's translation for we're all made in the image and likeness of God. Everybody matters. And imagine taking the court that way. Imagine, imagine coming out of a business meeting that way. It's a spirit and a culture. And finally, and Augustine was great at this, give them hope. Watch the news, we read the papers. We all know what's going on in our life, on our campuses, in our children's lives. There's a lot of weary people out there. There's a lot of disappointed, tired people who's, who may have lost some faith in the, in, in the walk on a, on, a, on a tough journey from Galilee to to Jerusalem. Give them hope. First Peter, be always ready to defend the hope that is within you. And do it with modesty and respect. Amen.